Hello and welcome to After the Arc. I am Yel Teagle. And I am Adrian Snow. We are talking about the seventh episode. Yes. We are more than halfway through. I know. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, so much happened this episode. So many exciting reveals. Yep. Uh, I want to start with Arc 3. But we're going to go to Arc 3. We're yes. going to take um, Bryce, Lane, Ava, that's the uh, initial choice mm. before we go with Strickland, who also joins. I wasn't expecting everyone to just be like dead, dead on the ground. Yes. If Arc 3 had exactly the same thing that happened to Arc 1, right? Yeah. Then what happened was they destroyed the cryopods mm-hmm. and then everyone that lost oxygen and they would have died. Yeah. Right? Like our, our people only are alive because Garnett woke up. Yeah. So it makes sense that everyone would be dead. But what's really interesting is that we see that there are no sleeper pods, which is really interesting because, right, we know from the beginning that we are four years from when Arc 1 exactly. launched. And I've said that for all we know, it could be hundreds of years. Yes. But I guess I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's been about four years. Yeah. Because we meet the lone survivor, Kelly, and I'm going to say it. I want it on record. She says. She's sus. She's absolutely. Sus. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I'm sci-fi rules. No body, no death. And lone survivor, bad guy. No. Yeah, because also <laughs> she tried to kill uh, Eva's right-hand man. Yes. And which we know that she was attempting to suffocate him, which makes me think, like, did she try and suffocate all her people? Like, what is... Because they're all... They all suffocated, right? Or they all, like, lo- they lost oxygen. Yes. So that kind of made me feel, mm, I don't know if I trust this person. Uh, and she did keep a gun, which yes. also super sus. Oh, that was such a fun reveal. Yeah. Um, I love the way, I mean, it's so evil, but I love the way she manipulates Strickland yeah. into getting rid of all the weapons. Yeah. Strickland has a, a really great point. Like, why would you have guns in space? It makes me wonder why Arc 3 has guns, but Arc 1 didn't. Yeah. What happened in the time between Arc 1 and Arc 3 uh, on Earth that yes. f- made them feel like they needed to have guns in space. Like, what do you anticipate you're going to find in space that requires a gun? It was a, a smart move to to basically leave them helpless towards mm-hmm. whatever she might be planning or doing. I also thought it was, like, kind of wild that they brought this woman and her friend on board, and they were like, yeah, feel free to walk around, talk to people, hang out and chill. I'm like... No, (laughs) this is not how we (laughs) handle people. We don't know. If she is the lone survivor, in their minds, again, I know lone survivor, probably murderer. Yeah. But they, in their minds, were like, poor innocent girl. No. (laughs) If they are the lone person in, in, like, uh, in space, they've done something evil to be (laughs) the only person in space. Like, that's yeah. just not. We do have the one body who has a knife in it, so who didn't yes. suffocate. I was like, print it, like <laughs> fingerprints, like figure it. Go get it, figure it out. <laughs> um, but we also get the reveal that they have faster than light travel. Yes, so FTL. She figured out how to convert energy into negative energy. It was part of my training. Negative energy. And that is how Arc Three was able to get there, uh, like nearly before them, and Arc Two as well, but. Arc 2, apparently, they blew up. Yeah. And so they couldn't, the FTL, like, couldn't work, or I was like, this is wild. Arc 2 vaporized when it tried to go to light speed. It, it does help us, like, to understand, like, okay, so the other arcs have new technology, and they will be going faster, and we will probably be encountering them more because... In the, like, four years since Arc 1 took off, they've been able to. Which speaks to, like, the fascination or, like, the interest in, like, technological advancement. So we could, yeah, reasonably jump leagues ahead in four years with our technology and have ships that go faster. I feel bad for Arc Mm 1, right? Like, if I... I mean, also, we find out that the world was, like, on fire and and dying. But yes. I think that had that not been the case, they should have sent a ship with an FTL to meet Arc 1, to board it while everyone's asleep, yeah. get it all set up for them. <laughs> and be like, hey. When you wake up, surprise. here's a little note. Yeah. <laughs> a little post-it. We, we fixed it. You. Yeah. <laughs> that would have been cool. And 
I don't know if they would have caught up in. I guess they could have caught up in time because technically they're supposed to be asleep for another year. Right. Um. So that, or I guess no, arc three would have been way ahead. nine months out. So yeah. they would have met them at the same time, right? They would have met them within three months. Wibbly wobbly timey wibbly, wimey. I know timey wimey. <laughs> but it was nice to have confirmed because I was. I've always su- suspected that Earth is dead. That mm. Earth is just gone. So it was nice to have confirmation that Earth was on that path um, in the in the amount of time that Arc 1 has been in space, that yes, the Earth has gotten worse. The Earth is on fire. And so now people are are basically hopping on shuttles and, and getting out of there. And we're also introduced to the character of Evelyn Maddox as a the creator of FTL Travel. Evelyn Maddox figured it out. The trillionaire took over Trust Industries. Well, that woman figured out faster than light speed. Which I have a feeling... When you drop first name, last name, we're going to get more information about this person. Mm. And so that was also nice to see. I think what's also exciting about mm-hmm. this episode is that we have, uh, I guess, a, a heartbreaking confirmation of what happened to Strickland's husband. Yeah. I was surprised that he was on the ship. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I know Kelly explained that that he had told the story about... Um, their daughter dying by stray bullet. I still think Kelly is sus. I don't know if I believe her. (laughs) But um, that is something that is really hard for... I don't think it's fair to Strickland. I wanted to find his husband. I'm, like, devastated that this is where we find him, right? Because the last we saw him was a hallucination holding a baby. Exactly. Um, And we find out that uh, his daughter would be eight. Okay, yeah. So... It's very interesting, especially because Kelly tells us that once FTL was working properly, um, families of Arc 1 were put onto it. Yeah. And that's so interesting because Robert seems to be the only family member we have found. I know. So where is everybody else? But but we also don't know a lot about everyone else's family members. Like, we do see Alicia's mom, Mm -hmm. and you would think that maybe she would have been there, but... We don't know enough really about the background of the family members to know, like, to recognize them if they were on the ship. I also originally thought that Kelly might have been his daughter. Oh. Um, which I was like, oh, that'd be a really cool twist that she was a daughter and maybe she just doesn't, like, want to admit it or, you know. Uh, but I then love that the idea. stray bullet, I was like, oh, okay. That's not, <laughs> that's not it. And she kept the gun. I was like, okay, well, now she's sus. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I think that's something that... I kind of hope isn't entirely true because I would like to see them to or be I would like for them to be able to have chances mm. with their family members at some point like maybe down the road. Yeah, I think it's it's a really interesting setup of what we are told is happening. Mm-hmm. We have an unreliable source. Yes. I also really like that moment of Cat calling out Angus with the aloe and then uh talking about like how uh, Alicia well, she didn't say Alicia, but I assume she was talking about Alicia because she said someone more age appropriate and someone more like you. Yes. Yes. Here are my thoughts. Okay. We know We know how I feel about Alicia and who she should be with. Price. But, <laughs> correct. <laughs> but we have this moment where Alicia and Angus are searching through the videos. Mm-hmm. And that is the moment that I started to ship them. Oh, yeah. So, yes, Kat, I agree. Thank you. And you also agree with me. I agree with that's you. That's what I've been shipping this whole time. Let's talk about what they find, because mm-hmm. that is amazing. Mm-hmm. They find that Arc 3 was attacked by Arc, Arc 15. 15. Yeah. What? Yeah. That's a big jump from 3 to 15. It is a big jump for the amount of time that they've been gone. Which, But with, with FTL travel, maybe they've like been able to like just like, you know, just get them out. Just factory style, mass production. Just maybe they have like Arc One Hundred for all we know. Um, so Ooh, that's a great point. <laughs> like could be. Oh my god! Co- I'm like thinking like planes, right? Mm-hmm. You know when you go to the airport and they're like, all right, this one's taking off, and you got to wait till it clears. Yeah, and then another one takes off. Yeah, is that what they've been doing for nine months? Potentially, if if they've had the time to make FTL and build up all the ships, it could just be shooting them out. If the Earth is on fire, I would imagine they'd just be like, okay, go, go figure it out. My thought when they said Arc 15 did it, and there's like the, like, there's a knife in someone's chest, 
I feel like people from Arc 15 got on Arc 3. Oh. Um, yeah. Interesting. And so that's kind of been my theory is that, well, then if they had like this, like, I don't think they turned on each other because why would they turn on each other? But we know there's like this, like, I don't know, villainous arc out there, then it would make sense for them to board and like, if they really want to kill people. <laughs> like, Arc 15 is pirates. <laughs> Arc 15 is pirates. Right? But then that, ex- like, well, what happened? That they've turned villainous, that they're mm-hmm. going after other arcs. Like, are they going after... My original theory was, like, they're going after trust. Mm. Because if he was so hated and they have figured out that he's on board of an arc, maybe they're just going after the earlier arcs and, like, killing them off. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. Speaking of trust... Yeah. Uh, we have our team, we go to get supplies and yeah. to steal the FTL. Yep. Um, and what ends up happening is we trigger a uh, a self-destruct failsafe. Yeah. And Lane seems to think that the right way to deal with that is to wake up trust. I didn't, I didn't agree with that choice at all. <laughs> like, I understand the choice. I, I don't agree with it either. Yeah. I understand the choice, right? He apparently was the only one that could stop it. I mean, he would have a code. Yeah, it makes sense if he was creator of all the arcs that he would have a code that could stop anything from happening. I just wish, like, maybe it was on a piece of paper. Because now I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. This guy, from from what I can tell, if they're modeling him after, like, the Elons, the Steve Jobs then I don't know if it's a good idea to wake this man. That's a lot of ego on one ship. Uh, I, like, I think it's a wake him, get the coat, and then put and then him back, back to sleep. Just yeah. like, just, okay, thank you, and just, like, close it over him, <laughs> and, and, and he goes to sleep. That would be perfect. Um, well, anything could happen at this point. Yeah. There is still uh, so much more. We are. And so at this point, yes, I would love to ask, mm-hmm. what are your top three wow moments of Episode 7? Okay, top three wow moments of episode seven. Mm-hmm. Um, dead bodies. Yes. Um, trust being Wait, woken mm-hmm. up. Uh, and I guess Arc 15 <laughs> attacking. Arc 15. Pirate, pirate arc attack. Pirate arc. I would say, well, cat. And also shipping my ship. I love that. Fine. I'm here for that. <laughs> uh, the introduction of Kelly. That's a big wow moment. We have someone who's not a part of the original ship who has, like, more more knowledge than we have. And, oh, Earth be- basically being dead. <laughs> like, Earth being essentially, like, on its way out is a big wow moment because it's just, like, there's nothing really for them to go back to. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's still so much more in this episode yeah. to break down. Uh, and we will do that. So don't go anywhere. We'll be back. First, I want to hear from you, Sam. What was it like joining the cast in the middle of the show? Oh, it was so fun. I was a little nervous at first. Um, I mean, I was going to Serbia, which I had never visited in my life, and I didn't know anyone there. And I knew I was joining a cast that had been together since, like, I think it was, like, mid-March, and I was coming mid-May. And so I was like, oh, they're going to all know each other and be friends. And so I was definitely a little nervous about it, but, like, everyone was incredibly welcoming. Like within a couple hours of me even getting to the hotel, like I had um, one of our cast members, Reese, like reach out and be like, hey, are you okay? Are you settled? Can I help you figure out how to get dinner tonight? Like, how can I help? Um, And just kind of, he just kind of like met me in a hallway and like gave me the lowdown on on what I would need to know to kind of like, you know, get, get through my first week and everything. So that was super nice. And then I slowly met everyone over the next couple of days, like on set um and everyone was so lovely and so welcoming and you know they'd go do fun things on the weekends and I was always included and I felt pretty quickly like I had kind of um joined this this wonderful cast of people that was yeah incredibly welcoming I I feel so lucky that um I got to be a part of that cast because not only are they incredibly talented people but they're wonderful just like as human beings so yeah that's so nice to hear, especially because, yeah. like, your character gets introduced and it's very different. It is a very, like, everyone's mm-hmm. standoffish and suspicious. And I'm going to say it. I've said it from the moment we saw her. I don't trust her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's fair. It's a fair suspicion for sure. 
Um, how was it, uh, do you think, Kelly's introduction? Did you like the way that we met her and her shenanigans, I'm going to call them? Yeah, I do like the way that she was introduced. I mean, like the first scene where we ever see her, she's like having this like badass moment where she's like running down a hallway. Lane pins me up against the wall and we kind of have a bit of a struggle and he's trying to figure out like, who are you? Can I trust you? Are you are you a good guy? Are you a bad guy? What's going on? And um, I think it's an awesome introduction. And it's mysterious. You don't really know when you first watch like, can we trust her? Can we not trust her? Did you feel that when you were reading uh, for this character when you first heard about it when you decided you wanted to be part of it was that what attracted you or is there something else about this character that you were like I want to play this role um well to be honest with you when I first auditioned I just got um episode seven I saw her as kind of a mystery in the same way that like the audience sees her when they see episode seven for the first time um obviously there was that bit at the end um one of the scenes I auditioned with was the scene where she takes the guns when she's a Strickland um and so that, that's like the one snippet I as an actor kind of got of like, okay, maybe there's something up with this girl. So um, I was just drawn in by her. I thought she was fascinating. I was like, I want to know, I want to know more. I want to know why is she stealing this gun? Like this big speech she gives to everyone on arc one, like how real is that? Is she lying? Like what are her true intentions? Like she was just such a fascinating character to me, like from the get go. It was like, I would love to do this role more than anything, just because I'm curious to see like where her story goes and like who she is beyond just how we see her in episode seven. So let's talk about episode seven, a slow death is worse. Let's talk first about this lone survivor, Kelly. Uh, Kelly, this actress, um, she's a, a charming young woman. Where did you find her? <laughs> she is my daughter. Um, which is something I swore I would never do, is <laughs> cast my own daughter in something. She is an actress. Um, we were working on the part, and it suddenly dawned on me, this is her, this is my daughter. I mean, it just, the, what we were describing was her. And so I had her uh, put herself on tape and audition, and she had to, the network had to approve her, and went to the network, and they approved her. Next thing you know, she was shipping off to Serbia to to play this part. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> I get to, I directed her in the the final episode, which was also weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How is it working with? I mean, Dean works with his wife. You're working with your daughter. How is that? Well, I mean, thankfully or not thankfully, depending on how you look at it on your perspective. I wasn't there when she started because mm. um, I, I couldn't leave the scripts in the writer's rooms, uh, which is why I always direct the last episode of the show because then the scripts are done. Uh, and so I was here in the States and she was in Serbia. I was not there to hold her hand or help her with anything. And, you know, luckily our actors are all really nice people and they all kind of took her under their, their wings. But she was thrown into the frying pan. Uh, she also essentially uh, gives us our, our exposition about what's going on on Earth and what happened. Was, was that something that you all had decided before? Like, okay, we know what, in the time that they were asleep, what has gone on on Earth and, and what's happening? Yeah, we, we knew pretty much, I mean, we knew what happened before the launch, so mm -hmm. we just extended it further. Okay. And um, so that's what she says. She tells us... What we think is the extension of where it was when they launched. Okay. At the end of this episode, we wake up Trust because we need him to give us the code. Trust has been uh, essentially a, a like a Chekhov's gun, right? We've known that he, we've known that he existed. Then we find out that he's on the ship. Was it always like he's got to wake up this season and be part of it? Yeah, we we always knew that Trust would eventually wake up and. And you'll see what he's going to do. But, uh, yeah. So far he's awake. He's given us a code. And he said, where am I? Yeah. He's he's a fun character. He's going to develop quite interestingly. This episode, I feel like, gave us so much information about Earth, about what happened in the time that we've missed, uh, including the FTL Maddox retrofit. We talked a little bit about how that um, works in terms of actual science. Um, what can you tell us about 
faster than light travel. Well, the concept that we that we portray of the of it creating a bubble around the ship that is actual physics theory that that is the only way to go travel faster than the speed of light. Of course, it would be probably hundreds of years in the future before we would develop it, but there are people working on it today. Um, the thing that we had to kind of fudge was the idea that it's just a thing added on to the to our current engines <laughs> because that we would have had to like replace the whole rear of the ship if we were following what the real science would probably be. Um, but it's a the, the bubble concept is the real is a real concept that is you know really being bannered around by physicists and many physicists say it's the only possible way that we could go faster than the speed of light is to warp to warp time and space and be in a bubble of it. So, wow. Yeah. Um, I also, I do like that, I mean, yes, you're sci-fiing it, but I do like that it's the size of a briefcase and you just plug it in. It's yeah. a plug and play. Yeah. Yeah, that we had to, I mean, you know, it would have been, probably in real life would be room size, but who knows? It doesn't exist yet. So we sure. we fictionalized it a little bit. By the time it exists, they now have a, a design of what it should look like. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. We all know that I would be useless on a spaceship, but we asked the cast what their skill set would be if they could go on the Ark. What skills would I bring to the Ark? Nothing! I don't know! I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm an okay cook. I can, I can cook some stuff though. Although I don't know if we have hobs and things. I, I actually haven't seen the cooking facilities. Oh, just like... Endless amounts of Shakespeare monologues. <laughs> I feel like I would be the entertainment. I would bring the skills of, um, of my role as the producer to make sure that the ship gets there to Proxima B on budget and on schedule. If I were on the crew, uh, the job they would give me would be storyteller because you always need good bedtime stories. They probably wouldn't let me on the arc because I wouldn't have any skills that would be any help to them. I'm not an engineer, I'm not a scientist, I'm, you know, I'm a writer, I'm a lowly writer, filmmaker. Maybe if they needed it documented, they'd want me on there. My humor, my sense of humor, and my knowledge of karate, which I don't know, but I would pretend that I do. As Miles, I don't know what I'd bring, to be honest. Um, <laughs> a good playlist. Optimism, I would put down as a skill. I'm an eternal optimist, um, so I think that you know, when things get a bit tough, maybe I could cheer people up. Play some Al Green or something and just get everybody singing. Me as Richard yeah. on the Ark, useless, utterly useless. I don't know, I have no idea. Like, the, I mean, Bryce is brilliant. He can fly things, he can fight things, he can do all this stuff. I'd be in the kitchen somewhere, do you know what I mean? They'd be telling me to chop onions or something. I'd be just like clinging on for dear life to a ticket because I don't know what, I don't know. I'd, get, I'd be good, I'd organize a few good parties. I think that'd be my role, that'd be it. I could be, I could be like cat. I could, be, maybe, I, perhaps I could be like a, a, a mental, mental health. Yeah, that's a good, that's a, that's a, that's a good answer. Uh, yeah, that's my answer. I think I would be kind of serving a role similar to cat. Um, I have a psychology degree. I got my degree in acting and psychology for undergrad. So I would definitely want to put the psychology to use and helping people on board to adjust to their new life and all that kind of thing. I will film everything that is happening to us, you know, and write it down. And they're like, that's useless. Like, what will we do with that? Um, but basically now while doing, while working on ARC, I realized that no one needs to light fire here, you know? Uh, so I think I will bring my exceptional organizational skills, uh, positivity, and I'm not a bad cook. I am definitely that person that I think a lot of, uh, I think people find very, comforting um, and I think I would be a great listener if anyone needed support and also I would know how to start a really good dance party. I wish I was as smart as Alicia Nevins because I know that I could help them survive. Uh, apart from that, optimism, hopefully hope. You know, if something goes wrong, I, I hope that me, myself, as Stacy, I'd go, don't worry, everything's going to be okay. You know, we're only dying, but don't worry. <laughs> Here's more from our chat with the stars of the show. When the show starts, yes, we've lost a lot of 
people at the beginning of the series, but also we've seen who already knew each other and who already uh, had some sort yeah. of relationship, right? Like the lieutenants knew each other. Strickland seemed very um, distant from everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, feels- he, he's some kind of an outcast. I mean, he made himself, I believe, some kind of an outcast because he's, he's, uh, his connection with the ship is like much more different than anybody else's he's not there because he wanted to go there he's there because he was ordered to go there and leave his family back on earth and and makes him a lone gunner throughout this series i feel like you know we reveal little secrets about everybody and strickland we we do reveal his secrets but he continues to hold his cards very close to his chest i feel like strickland is so private and so secretive yeah that he's that kind of man and uh, I mean, I want to say I can relate to that. Uh, not like holding my secrets as if I have any gruesome secrets, but like uh, being private and being, you know, being private about himself and his family, especially his family, is something I can really, really relate to, especially because, you know, uh, when you're known and when you're into this kind of business and uh, you know people wanting to know more and more and more which i completely do not especially understand if you know what i mean you know that hunger for for somebody else's privacy but i tend to as strickland and as myself we tend to keep things to ourselves you know yeah, absolutely. It makes total sense. And I mean, Strickland specifically as security, it feels yeah, yeah. right that he would do that. Yeah, he cannot let go any information that's not needed to be let go. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to take it back to something you said earlier, that you're not okay. particularly uh, into sci-fi I mean, obviously, I I I uh, I watched a lot of sci-fi movies, but not as m- m- most sci-fi fans watched sci-fi movies. I- I'm more into uh, like epic drama or history uh, history drama or something like that, uh, war films and and stuff like that. But this was this was something that. Um, it's completely different. I mean, especially, listen, um, I've been granted a wish to act in English, which was my wish since I was a kid. So uh, especially with this project and these people and this kind of uh, 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 this kind of a show and uh, this character is something that is completely off the charts for me. And, you know, not in my wildest dreams would I imagine to to work on something like this. And now it's reality and hopefully it will continue and, you know, it will be... Viewers will find it amazing and wanting more and more and more. And I'm more than willing to, to reply to that, if you know what I mean. I, I want to talk a little bit about episode seven. Gotten a little bit of tease about Strickland's husband Robert we've seen him in a hallucination um but now yeah. we've, we've seen him and and he's gone um there was such a, a moving and powerful performance um it was heartbreaking tell me about having to shoot that thank you I mean <laughs> it's it's one of those I think it's one of those fight or flight moments you know it's like Give, give give it all you got. So uh, I've got a funny story about that episode, about that scene in particular. So uh, as you've seen it, I I'm on another spaceship and there's a you know fifteen bodies all around and I'm trying to identify each and every one of them. And uh, I turn one of them and find that it's Robert, and it's like horror, disbelief, shock everything especially because he he's like on this quest to find out what's going on with his family because he doesn't know that and with the crew guy and the camera guy we said you know the blocking we said like okay we go uh uh from here to here and like 
you turn him around and then in your close up, give it all you got. <clears throat> so we got all these extras and uh, they're lying down and I'm, I've prepared that whole day for that scene because it's quite, you know, emotional and intense and, and it's not like every other scene, obviously. It's like a pinnacle of that character. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay, the, the director, Milan, asked me like, are you ready? I'm like, okay, let's go. And first take, I'm identifying the bodies. I go to Robert, I turn him over, they go full close up. And at that point, the extra guy fell asleep. He was like in full dream mode behind me because he was lying there for like half an hour and he was asleep. It did not, uh, it did not, you know, throw me away. It did not throw me away. It was, <laughs> it was actually, I managed to do two more shots of that, which were even better as we moved along. But after that first one, I went to him and I, I never get those, I never do those diva moments where like, take him away, you know, <laughs> behead this guy or whatever. No, I just asked him politely, like, could you not please, you know, sleep while we're working with, he was so embarrassed, the poor guy. He was like, oh, I don't know how this happened. I it will not happen again, you know. Did I ruin your moment? I was like, no, you did nothing. Just please don't do it again. So <laughs> yes, I'm glad that 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 you 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 find it that way because it's it's like the pinnacle of that that character and it meant a lot to me to to give it all I had. Yeah, I mean it, it feels devastating in the scene. And then we go on to find out even more news about. <laughs> his daughter and that she also is gone um listen i, I know you don't watch sci-fi but there's a rule in sci-fi <laughs> no body no death so i do not believe yeah i refuse to believe that his daughter is dead yeah likewise i'm i'm um i talked to to dean devlin and jonathan glasner about that particular uh uh thing i mean because the other parent is out so we don't know where the child is is she uh, uh on earth or maybe on some other arc we have no idea so i feel like his quest and like motivation to go on and to live on is like to find his daughter wherever in the universe she might be so that's like a really, really strong motivation to go on because otherwise I thought like, if they're all dead, like what what purpose do I have anymore? So uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I, that seems like a real good driving force, parental uh, motivation. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, I can relate to that. <laughs> I can really, really relate to that. Um. Strickland also has a sword. We we meet the sword. Um, I would love to know more about this sword. How are you with the sword personally? Well, the thing is, I actually introduced the sword to to the show because when when even before we started shooting, I I had a talk with Dean Dean Devlin and I said like, uh, listen, if if whenever you need uh, some martial arts or samurai sword fighting, I'm I'm up for it because they trained kendo for like five five six years and he was like kendo i was like yeah sure samurai sword fight and he said we need to put that sword in the show so uh yeah that was it and uh i'm really glad i'm really really glad we made that happen because because it's so cool <laughs> you know? it's so random and i love it <laughs> Because it feels, I mean, everybody has interests. Everybody's into stuff. So it makes total sense that that this sword would come into play and, and appear on the ship. Kendo, kendo or, or samurai, sword fight. The training that, it, it gives you, it, it completely makes sense because the training for that is like, you need a lot of discipline. Samurai sword fight is like playing chess, which is like hundreds and thousands of times 
uh, uh, more fast than the regular chess. So it 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 completely makes sense why he would carry that kind of thing with him. We are sitting down with the writer of this episode, John Paul Nickel. Hello. Hi, hi. Hello. Thanks for having me. Um, let's jump in. This episode introduces a new character. It's the first time we've gotten a new character. Yes. Um, I've said it before. I'm going to say it again. I want it on the record. I don't trust a lone survivor. Never really? trust a lone what, survivor. What would make you think from what you've seen in this episode that you couldn't trust this lovely young woman? I mean, the the gun thing. Oh, that? What? You know, people need to protect themselves in space or something. A dead a, a body with a knife in it? Well, you know, people trip, they fall. <laughs> Cutlery is, is you know, it's, it's a skill tool, you know. Her trying to suffocate uh, everybody. Everybody needs a hobby. <laughs> I don't trust her. <laughs> I don't trust her. Um, talk to me about writing a new character, because you get to introduce this I know. Character. It was so much fun. Because we talked about her a lot before we committed. Uh, and in one iteration, actually in maybe two iterations of the script, it was two characters. Oh. Uh, a lot of moving set pieces in just production and making a television show eventually. We were like, could we, could we make this one character? Um, and the budget declared, yes, <laughs> we could. <laughs> uh, but it was the right move. It, you know, we, we'd, we'd broken this out that the other character and Kelly were kind of doing these different plot things on the on the on the in the episode and the other character was definitely going to be the one that was more suspicious so to speak mm. and we'd play Kelly really cards down uh, and not reveal what was up with her uh, until a later episode and you, you know we didn't really reveal we just knew we revealed there's something up with her and as we went through it we realized you know we could we could kind of bring these two C and D plots of what they were doing, merge them, make it one character. That's going to be a lot more interesting. It'll give them something to do. And that way we're following just one new person on the ship. Well, she gives us a little bit of a tease about what may or may not have happened to Strickland's family. Right. And how the people on Arc 3 ended up on Arc 3 because they're not supposed to be the people that right. are on Arc 3. Like you're kind of putting two different groups on Arc 3 as the writer. Yes. And... We're being told by an unreliable narrator what happened. Right. Like I said, suspicious. Um, and we only know she's unreliable until that scene where we see the gun. Mm -hmm. So everything up uh, to that point. Sorry. Moment we see her, unreliable. No, 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 no. <laughs> Moment, she's defending herself. Lone survivor. Lone survivor because she defended herself. Uh-huh. Go on. What, what, what was she to do? <laughs> uh, um... So yeah, she's an unreliable narrator, right. and the and sort of the fun is what's true, what's not, what is she, you know, and also some of the best lies are are rooted in truth. Mm -hmm. So how much truth is she using? Uh, and that's the that's the fun of the unfolding uh, character of Kelly, and just just the idea of what's going on back home, because we the audience want to know what's going on back home and out in the out in the greater galaxy of of Arc One, but hopefully. Hopefully the audience wants to know as well. And uh, and Kelly's a tool to get some of that out there and, and and then engage our characters and give them drama as well. So, Yeah. As a writer, do you have to come up with, I guess, the truth and then the lie on top of the truth or just the lie and then you'll figure out the truth later? Um, we we kind of need to figure out both. Because if you figure out just the lie, you kind of need to figure out why she is telling this specific lie, what is she trying to hide? Mm. So uh, you wouldn't want to accidentally back into a, a, a situation where she was in theory lying, but then it turned out she was telling the truth only because we made decisions later down the road. I see. Um, but also th the truth, and maybe Kelly was telling the truth. Who No, I, I don't know. I haven't seen any other episodes. I'm with you. Um future episodes things change that's the fun of a writer's room and and having to change things because we got a better idea we got some notes there was a budget issue what have you uh so sometimes things change and the and the truth could change and so then you have to you have to always be keeping on the ball with what you've already done if it hasn't been shot yet uh to go back and change it that's the fun of a serialized show and i think to me, this is one of my favorite episodes of the season because this is where we really turn mm -hmm. and become, I think, serialized in a really good way. Um, I mean, we, we've set up all these character emotional arcs, 
but now we're really getting into like so we we've met the characters we've met the world we've shown that that arc three is is a is a problematic ship um and now we've we've opened the door and we've expanded the world and I, we're, we're sort of on a roller coaster now for the rest of the season in the best possible way I think people are going to be frustrated week to week. I think they're going to be like, why can't we binge this? Why can't we watch it right now? If we've done our jobs right. You have. <laughs> uh, let's talk about in episode seven, a slow death is worse. Um, Dr. Kabir is going through withdrawal. She has yeah. admitted that she has this addiction um, and she's now having surgery. She's performing surgery, going through withdrawal. Uh, and loses a patient on the table. This was such a, a like heartbreaking scene and episode. Um, how did it yeah. feel for you? I couldn't imagine bearing that burden of guilt. I think guilt is one of the worst feelings you could ever experience. And to have it on that scale, to have to feel like you're responsible for someone losing their life. And I think as well, it was what was great was because we shot the episodes in in chronological order there was just like this constant emotional build in terms of the research and the work that I was doing behind the scenes in in building that in building her addiction and then kind of and then going through the the come down of that as well that really helped me as well because I had kind of gone through it as it as a as she would have gone through it that storyline in itself was just an incredible emotional exercise and creative exercise for me. And one that I definitely took very seriously because I know it's a reality for a lot of people. Um, but then it's also kind of like trying to strike the right balance in terms of serving the story and not letting it overwhelm the scene because no one else can know. It's like, like a functional, like a functional out addict. That was kind of the biggest challenge for me, I think, was having this such a turbulent internal life and then not being able to show it on the outside, which is very like, I'm the type of person, whatever I'm feeling on the inside, you'll know about it on the outside. Wow. I mean, that's why you're an actor. You're so good <laughs> at hiding yeah. it. <laughs> Well, let's talk about episode seven, A Slow Death is Worse. Uh, in this episode, we have a blossoming, blossoming uh, relationship with Agus awesome. and Alicia as they're searching for oh. the arc through the um, footage from arc three. Yes. Uh, tell me about this, because really, you know, you guys are not looking at video footage. You're looking at a green screen. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, this was difficult. Like, I feel like you don't realize how difficult it is until you do it. But like all this, all this stuff of us watching stuff on a screen, there's also that bit where um, Bryce is showing me how his glove like got disintegrated from the element and I'm watching that. All those bits, like I'm just looking at a gray, a gray slate with like green sticky dots. And I'm like trying to like, you know, be like, whoa, this is cool kind of thing. <laughs> um, and the same with that scene in arc three where we're, we're looking at the the cat the, the footage. Um, yeah, me, me and Stacey are just sitting there like, whoa, <laughs> we don't know what we're looking at, but this is cool. Did you guys like time out reactions? Like, okay, so we're gonna be shocked and then count to three and then be scared and then we weren't going. They, they, I think they just assumed we we were just gonna react at the same time. But I think what we <laughs> did was we. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, but I, yeah, we spoke to the first AD and they were like, and yeah, we said like, oh, okay, so when like you say, you say this, then we'll react to it. Um, so <laughs> all you all we'd be doing is looking at a blank screen, the first AD, like his booming voice, like telling us what's happening. And we're like, cool, now let's react. <laughs> um, but yeah, super, it was, it was, it was fun though. It was really fun. Do you think you're now like a pro at uh, green screen work? You're like, I can imagine anything in front of me now. Yeah, you know what? It's 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 so much fun because like it really like gives your imagination a workout, you know, um, which is great because like as a that's all we did as a kid, right? We just like it, this this job was like so much fun. It really made me feel like a kid again because not not that I'm you know too far into adulthood adulthood but like you know just like back to like playing just as a kid because like 
you just do have to imagine uh, just the most crazy stuff. Um, I'd love to do more though. Like there is some stuff that like the others got to do that I'm super jealous of, like a lot of like action packed stuff and like going outside of the ship and everything like that. That's I'd love to do that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it's 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 definitely like really good to have that under my belt now that I could, that I've done that, you know. We're posting photos from the Ark on our Instagram every week, and we want to see you caption them with clever comments. If we like what you have to say, we might feature it here on the show. So check us out every week at After the Ark. Thank you so much for joining us here at After the Arc, the official after show for the Arc. If you want to keep the conversation going, give us a follow on Instagram at After the Arc. Until next time, I'm Yel Teagle. I'm Adrian Snow. And we'll see you next week.